Hey everybody, this is Rishi Agarwal, and in this video I'm going to be talking about signs of right heart strain on a CT pulmonary angiogram. Now before getting into the radiology, I wanted to talk about how to stratify patients who have acute PE clinically. And the main way to do that is to determine whether or not they have hemodynamic instability. Now let's think for a moment about what a pulmonary embolism does in the body. A pulmonary embolism is a blood clot that usually forms in the veins of the lower extremities or in the pelvis, and it moves up the IVC into the right atrium, then the right ventricle, and then to the pulmonary arteries. Now in a normal patient, blood flows from the pulmonary arteries back to the left heart and then goes to the body. In a patient with a pulmonary embolism, some of that blood flow does not make it back to the left heart. If that blockage of blood flow back to the left heart is sufficiently large, it can be enough to cause systemic hypotension. It usually takes a large clot to cause systemic hypotension. However, if a patient already has pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease, you can have a small clot and the patient can get hypotensive. The clinical criteria for classifying a patient as hemodynamically unstable in the setting of PE are pretty well defined. It includes a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury, or a drop in the systolic blood pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury. Also, if the patient requires vasopressors or inotropes in order to support their blood pressure, then that patient is automatically classified as being hemodynamically unstable. Now for CT, these are not usually the patients that we're interested in classifying. In fact, some of these patients who are hemodynamically unstable may not even make it to the CT scanner until they're actually stabilized. What we're interested in is this intermediate group. These are patients who are hemodynamically stable, but they have some signs of right heart strain. Right heart strain can be classified in many different ways, including EKG signs, troponin increases, and echocardiography signs, but we're going to be talking about right heart strain on CT. The reason why this is important is because signs of right heart strain on CT can be predictors of morbidity and mortality. This is the first study that I could find that showed that right ventricular enlargement on chest CT predicted an early death in patients with acute PE. In this study, they took the axial images and then reconstructed them into four chamber views. And they used a right ventricle to left ventricle ratio of greater than 0.9 to define right ventricular enlargement. Subsequent studies have shown that you don't need to reconstruct four chamber views in order to measure RV enlargement. And I'll show you how to measure the RV to LV ratio on axial images. This meta-analysis of over 13,000 patients showed an increased RV to LV ratio was associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality of about 2.5. In addition to RV enlargement, as defined as an increased RV to LV ratio, I'm going to be talking about other signs like septal bowing, pulmonary artery enlargement, and refluxed contrast into the IVC and hepatic veins. So let's get into it. Before looking at some abnormal patients, I want to first show you what a normal RV to LV ratio looks like in this patient. So this is a normal patient, and it's not a PE study, but it's going to serve our purposes just fine. So what I want to do first is measure the left ventricle. So I'm just scrolling up and down, trying to find the spot where the left ventricle is at its largest in transverse diameter. And I think it's about right here. So I'm gonna measure from endocardium to endocardium, and that is 5.2. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the right ventricle, looking for the spot where the right ventricle is the biggest. So I don't have to measure it on the same axial slice as I did the left ventricle. One thing I want to note, though, is the position of the tricuspid valve because I don't want to accidentally measure too high up and measure the right atrium. So I'm going to note the position of the tricuspid valve. In this case, I think it's about the same axial slice as where I measured the left ventricle. So I'm going to measure from here to here, and that number is about 4.3. So 4.3 over 5.2, that comes out to about 0.82. So that's less than 0.9. So this is a normal RV to LV ratio. 
What you should know is that if you decide to use the smaller ratio as your threshold, 0.9, then you're going to have a higher sensitivity. And if you use the higher ratio, 1.0, then you're going to have a higher specificity. OK, let's look at some abnormal examples now. Here's our first example. So let me just widen the windows. And you can see that there's pretty large pulmonary embolism in the left pulmonary artery and in the right pulmonary artery going out into the lobar and segmental arteries. So I want to measure the RV to LV ratio. So I go down to the heart and I first measure the LV. So I'm scrolling up and down and I think it's right about there. And the LV is 4.1 and the RV is 4.8. Now I just told you that you don't have to measure the RV on the same slice that you measured the LV. But if you can demonstrate that the RV is bigger than the LV on one single slice, then that is ideal. And the reason why that's better is because if you decide to measure the RV on a different slice, then you could get into a situation in which you're getting into a different phase of the cardiac cycle, particularly if the scan was performed on a slower scanner. So if you can measure it on the same slice, then that's ideal because you know for a fact that you're looking at the exact phase of the cardiac cycle from the RV to the LV. So in this case, we have an RV of 4.8 and an LV of 4.1. And so that ratio is greater than 1. So this is a sign of right heart strain. In cases where I have right ventricular enlargement, another sign that I'm going to be looking for is flattening of the interventricular septum. Now, normally the interventricular septum is slightly bowed out towards the right ventricle. But in this case, and this is not the best example, the interventricular septum isn't bowed toward the right ventricle, but instead it's slightly flattened. And you could even say that it's slightly bowed towards the left ventricle. So in this case, because I have the right ventricular enlargement, I would also say that I have some very mild interventricular septum flattening. Now, in addition to septal flattening, I'm going to scroll up to the pulmonary artery. And I want to measure the pulmonary artery because an enlarged pulmonary artery is an additional sign of right heart strain. So I'm going to go from here to here, and that's 3.2. So that's already enlarged. If I use a threshold of 2.9 centimeters, then this is an enlarged pulmonary artery. And I can also use a ratio of pulmonary artery to aorta greater than 1 as being enlarged. So I also want to measure the ascending aorta at the same level, and I'm getting 3.2 as well. So it's right at the borderline of what I would call an enlarged pulmonary artery by ratio. So in this case, we have three signs of right ventricular strain. We have enlargement of the right ventricle, which is our best sign. We have some very slight flattening of the interventricular septum, and we have pulmonary artery enlargement. Let's take a look at another case. Here's another case of a pulmonary embolism. Now, this wasn't an acute PE. It's more of a subacute to chronic PE. And I know that because when I look at the PE itself, rather than being central within the vessel, it's more eccentric along the vessel wall. And if I look at my most reliable sign for right heart strain, I'm looking at the RV to LV ratio and the RV is greater in size than the LV in transverse dimension. But the sign that I wanted to show you in this case is that there's a reflux of contrast into the IVC and even a little bit into the hepatic veins. So just imagine why this might occur. In a normal patient, you inject the contrast and it goes from their SVC to their right atrium and it gets sucked up by a normal, vigorously pumping right ventricle. Now in this patient who has an abnormal right ventricle and their right ventricular function is diminished, their right ventricle can't really keep up with the flow of contrast into the right atrium. So some of it gets refluxed down into the IVC.
Now this finding is not as reliable as the RV to LV ratio and I think one of the reasons why is because the flow rate or the injection rate that you're putting the contrast in can vary from one scan to the next scan. So if you inject the contrast at a very high rate, then even in a normal patient, you might have a little bit of contrast refluxing into the IVC. And if you inject the contrast at a low rate, then even in a patient who has right ventricular dysfunction, you may not see this sign. So it's highly dependent on technique, and so in my opinion, this sign is not as reliable. This is the last example that I wanted to show you, and unfortunately I was not able to get the DICOM, so I can't make measurements on this, but it's a really good case of interventricular septal bowing, which I'll show you in a second. But right off the bat you could see that the pulmonary artery is enlarged compared to the aorta. Here are the pulmonary emboli. And when we scroll down to the heart, you can see that the right ventricle is massively dilated compared to the left ventricle. And this is what I wanted to show you here. So you have bowing of the interventricular septum towards the left ventricle. So it's not just flattening, but it's actually bowing in towards the left ventricle. And this is the final sign that I wanted to show you of right heart strain. This is not a very common sign, but if you see it, particularly with this degree, you can be pretty confident that you're dealing with elevated right heart pressures. Okay, to summarize, remember that the RV to LV ratio greater than 0.9 or 1 is our best sign of right heart strain from acute PE. And then the other signs are interventricular septal flattening or bowing, pulmonary artery enlargement, and then reflux of contrast into the IVC or hepatic veins. So if you have any questions about any of the content I talked about today, please leave me a comment below and I'll try to get to it. Thanks.